Okay, this is the 23rd lecture in this series about the creation of an international sustainable civilization. And um, the previous lecture was about capitalism and how the globalization process was uh, mismanaged. And there were a few American companies and greedy people who really took control of the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and structured it in a way that favored American economic interests at the expense of developing countries and even at the expense of their own working class. So now when that's true, when uh, the under-resourced people in a society are expected to be lifted up by globalization. They're disillusioned, they're disappointed. Uh, some of them are losing hope. Um, they're trying, they want to find someone to blame. Um, and that's happening within the US also. So now there's always the rise, a danger of a rise of an authoritarian leader who says, I will fix this and they've, create some demon to blame and um, get elected or get put into power. And then they just centralize the power to help their friends and their family. And you have an authoritarian government. So this lecture is takes excerpts from a book by the uh, uh, specialists paid by the... Um, the Brookings Institute and they um, okay. so in particular the person so they have a book out called Democracies Divided um The Global Challenge of Political Polarization. So uh, before the quote that's in this uh, PowerPoint, it said that when the wall came down, when Eastern Europe capitalism was opened up, uh, Eastern Europe allowed for capitalism, Russia allowed for capitalism, and most pundits and most, you know, leaders in economics and politics thought that, oh, capitalism will grow, democracies will grow, that once you have a free market, all the authoritarian governments will decline because they no longer have absolute control of the economic system. But that's not what's happening. Something else is happening. And so... So the previous lecture sort of explained what else happened is a very few people got control of the economic system. And so now you have all the instability that comes from that. But anyway, so the introduction says, um, democratic stagnation and setbacks have marked the first half, first two decades of this century. Today, talk of a global democratic crisis is widespread and this was published maybe five years ago. And it's so, of course, it's getting a lot worse. Political polarization manifested in increasingly harsh divides between opposing political camps and diminishing shared political ground is a crucial part of this troubling picture. And so the first chapter, the introduction, tells a number of trends that are occurring all over the world. And then it has seven case studies and a conclusion. So one of the case studies is the US and then one of them is Indonesia. So this lecture will talk more generally about the issues involved and the responsibility of intellectuals and the role that Indonesia could play in leading in preventing polarization 
or overcoming it, setting using their cultural background, their panchasila, and their uh, traditions from the past to actually avoid uh, falling into authoritarianism, but also to, to be a model to other countries for how to save democracy. So intellectual leaders, especially those in the humanities, should use their expertise to reduce polarization. The reason why they can is that you can teach history, literature, the arts, philosophy, and theology in a way that shows our common humanity. This is what my lectures are trying to do, right? Theology should be monism, but monism that doesn't lead to authoritarianism. Philosophy, I have suggested, is Aristotle's uh, view of God and his view of virtues. It is not the only model, but... It's a model that you can use to understand patterns in history, uh, patterns in literature. In tragedy, it's about types of characters, types of situations they get into, types of choices they make, types of arguments they give. And so you can learn. This was the leap in consciousness where people realized, gee, we are the creature that can identify patterns in a world where there really are patterns. So we should use this capacity to educate each other about, educate ourselves and each other about how sh we should live. That includes integrating nature and culture, respecting nature, but it also includes patterns in human affairs and how we can, patterns in what it means to flourish, patterns in what you do to create a society where people are flourishing. So that's why uh, the humanities, I think, have a unique uh, role to play in this. Um, all right, so Eve Warburton was, is the person assigned to cover Indonesia and to describe the polarization in that country. Um, Indonesia, there were different types of polarization, the most extreme, and Indonesia was the least extreme. And so she says, um, she also says it's difficult to know if the polarized political rhetoric really represents the sentiments and opinions of the public. So this is where Indonesian intellectuals, college teachers, if they are more isolated from, or professionals, if they get isolated, from the common people, the villagers, they might think it's worse than it actually is. So it's important to stay in touch with people, not only to, to find out if it's a problem, but also to go in there and minimize the problem, be proactive about uh, preventing it or creating a new set of social networks that would bind people together so we could save our democracy. What are the factors that are leading to authoritarian leadership? Our disillusionment with the political establishment and growing income inequality. So that's happening everywhere. And a part of that is because the rich all over the world are paying for the political campaigns of people in countries where presidents and political leaders have to be elected and once they get, and people are buying into the advertising and the rhetoric, once they get elected, they do whatever the rich tell them. So then people get disillusioned with the political system because it really should be dedicated to creating a middle class, not pandering to the rich. It shouldn't be creating a whole legal institutional system that helps the rich get richer. It should be a counterpart to greed, a counterpart to the economic system. So when the wall came down, you went from an extreme where the political system controlled the economic system to then people bought out. They thought they overly idealized capitalism and they did not regulate enough. And they also allowed the rich 
to pay for political campaigns so that political leaders are puppets of the rich. So this is, you know, this has to be called out. Um, intellectuals need to try and educate the broader public about what's going on and also what to do from uh, from now on. So um, uh, War, War Burton, when she's describing Indonesia, she says that the voters do agree on a number of non-religious issues. And so this presentation is going to emphasize specifically university community engagement projects are non-religious issues. And that could definitely be used to nurturing this impulse for centrism and moderation. She could also have referred to the fact that it wasn't that long ago that Indonesia was caught between two extremes, the Islamists and the communists. And so there still is a tradition of thinking moderate Islam is best, just based on their political experience. And then the scholars are supposed to be, I think they are, writing a, a more articles, books, pamphlets, whatever, about how Islam is truly a humanistic, pluralistic religion. And because Indonesia is so 88% Muslim, that would have the most effect. Its scholars should be writing about the other religious traditions are also humanistic and tolerant. It's most important though, especially at the UN schools, that the scholars keep writing about it so that they keep a history going and a history of Islam in Indonesia, but also try to get things written or get lectures that would speak to a broader public. After an extensive overview of the particular political candidates and campaigns, which I will talk about more in the next lecture. Under remedies, Mr. Uh, Ms. Warburton lists a number of NGOs and a number of groups that fund the interfaith dialogues. And I think one of them is called the Wahid Center or Foundation. And so these are large uh, philanthropic organizations that tolerate, that try to construct, create a network of interfaith dialogues and community initiatives that try to combat hate speech and religious extremism and that sponsor online social media channels that encourage religious tolerance, cultural awareness, and fact-based knowledge production and a positive online discourse. So, I myself, a few lectures back, tried to figure out how to create a positive online discourse about the problem of child marriage. But I think you could, you could ex extend that. Make sure you include empathy. Make sure you communicate to people on social media that you understand why something is a problem. And then you can just sort of tell a story to explain how to get over that particular fear or that particular um, issue that's polarizing the country. Okay. Um, after describing efforts to overcome polarization, she says, it's unlikely, however, that such efforts will have a measurable impact on political polarization unless there's a genuine buy-in from Indonesia's political elite. Um, and this is where Marif talked about the corruption of Indonesia's political elite, where she said they end up treating, um, they end up behaving like the colonizers. And he was very upset about that. So he would definitely agree with this. And then she observes that in a recent election, both candidates called for an end to fake news and smear campaigns, yet both candidates had dedicated a cyber armies, lots of employees that were tasked with generating social media messages 
that question their rival's personal piety, whether they're really Muslim, which is a corruption, you know, using religion, weaponizing religion, and cast them as a threat to Indonesia's national identity, which would be Pancasila. So it is important that you don't weaponize religion and that you make sure and you don't weaponize Pancasila. It's completely um, a complete corruption of both of them. When I first read Pancasila, I connected it with my scholarship in Aristotle, the United Nations Capabilities Approach, and the UN Sustainability Development Goals, which I've said before. I've also read about the way Indonesia's political leaders have applied Pancasila in what they do in ways that sometimes justify authoritarian behavior, very different from what I think of as the spirit of Pancasila. So I'm not Indonesian, I won't tell Indonesians what to do, but scholars need to help students think critically about the different uses and abuses of Pancasila. They should, uh, Indonesian college students should definitely know that history so that they think critically every time a new president or an administration tries to use Pancasila, that they will have a good education in what political, what the five principles really are about. And then they can call out a politician for corrupting them. But as an American, my society has similar problems. In the name of freedom, we allow the rich to control all aspects of our lives. So we have our Declaration of Independence is uh, what our founders meant by it and what, how it gets interpreted. There's also the fact that our founders really knew that if you don't have a strong and stable middle class, you're not gonna be able to develop or preserve a democracy. And so today they would advocate for more public education because you have to have a good public education system to have people get the jobs to be middle-class. That did not used to be true. You know, you didn't have to have more than a grade school education to go out and start a farm, run a homestead. But as things change, we really, in our country, we really need to change. The fact that we even have a public school uh, institutions is because there's two little words in our um, pre preface to the, to the constitution that says it's the job of the Congress to make laws to secure us against foreign enemies. I think it was to secure people's property or something, but also the common welfare. And so that's how we have any sort of uh, social security or healthcare, government healthcare or public schools or public parks, why they aren't illegal. <laughs> Um, it has to be defended on these two little words. And so the Republicans always try to minimize and to maximize the freedom of the capitalists, of the economic sector. And that is a corruption. That is not what our founders uh, were thinking, had in mind. And there are many books out now about that. But anyway, point is that I have to do this in my country with my political ideology, and you need to do this in your country with your political ideology. So we're all in this together, trying to preserve democracy. Okay, how else can Indonesians um, promote democracy? First of all, they can refer to the tradition of Gotong Royong, village uplift, to prevent polarization and promote democracy. They can be from different religious traditions, ethnic backgrounds, socioeconomic classes, and still work with each other to solve problems in their communities. Indonesia has a tradition of earthquakes, volcanoes, floods that devastate communities and that call for people to work together. In the future, many of the natural disasters will be even worse and more frequent because of climate change. This is, again, why the leaders in Indonesia 
should be able to get elected for pointing out climate change and for working with companies in Indonesia or elsewhere that will construct a green energy grid, bring in green energy products. It should be a lot easier. It should be easier in Indonesia uh, because it's so obvious that there are problems and they're getting worse. Scholars could continually point out the tradition of working together. A polarized public will, will make so much life so much harder for Indonesians as they fight to survive. So scholars can just be part of that whole process of working to get people to work together on just community projects. So Indonesian scholars who are required to be involved in a, in a UCE project, this is really a huge opportunity. And I wish that would happen in the US, but I have a whole PowerPoint on why it doesn't, that it doesn't, why it doesn't. They should take this expectation seriously. So I have heard that some of them um, kind of minimize, they sign up for something or whatever, but this could be a really serious issue that requires a lot of planning and organization. It could really benefit Indonesia and nurture its democracy. They could use it to weave people together and reduce polarization. When they put together a group of students and faculty for a project, they should try to choose people from different religious traditions and different parts of Indonesia, different ethnicities, social classes, gender, etc. They should also find sponsors from different ethnic, religious, and social groups so that the villagers, they come to the village and the villagers see everyone working together on a project. You know, and that always brings people together is when they're working on some project that has a very concrete uh, end point. So the villagers can see with their eyeballs that these people came and helped them out. They can keep the project going for decades, hopefully. That's just a part of the history of the village is that people came together to do this. One aspect of each project could also include some interfaith dialogues. In the evenings when people are done working, could organize some interfaith dialogue. People in the project and in the village speak together about their religious beliefs, but also about other aspects of their culture, other values they cherish. They could tell each other about the social media sites that, that keep up this kind of conversation and also point out there are social media sites that polarize and alienate people. And they could say that's happening around the world. It's destroying democracy. It's not true. This is not what Islam is. Uh, Panchasila, religious pluralism is actually true. And if the professors can come and just show some empathy for the villagers. That is a pretty scary social media site or there's a lot of wicked people who really do use religion. It occurs in the US. Just again, you have to have empathy and then sort of talk them out of it. Um, that's a contribution a scholar could make. Because of the rise of China and international tensions, Indonesians with a Chinese ethnicity could donate to UCE projects and have the logo of their companies on the buildings so that the villagers know that ethnic Chinese Indonesians are committed to the well being of Indonesia. So they'd have, hopefully, they'd have some of them yeah, working on the project, so they'd have that memory. Then they'd have the logo, they'd have some photographs. And so that would just be part of the history of their village, their personal history. And that would be linked to Indonesia's history, to what the scholars tell them about Confucianism and religious pluralism, humanitarianism, all that sort of stuff. So that that's how you would weave it together. In my country, it's just very hard 
to keep emphasizing our founders wanted a middle class. They would care more about middle class than about um, tax breaks for billionaires, you know, deregulating the economy. Over and over again, we have this so. Now, my friend Jarut Wayundi teaches at Uin Jakarta, and he has been in contact with a man named John Enright at DePaul University, whose big project, his reputation is based on asset-based community development, ABCD. And Jarut has really internalized that, and he's very good at it. So he set up this system and he's educating um, all the people in charge of these projects in the UN schools. So I was there, I was staying with him when they were meeting, they meet once every two years with the minister, the highest person in the Ministry of Religious Affairs and or education about these community development projects. They have some Westerner keynote speakers. I was a keynote speaker. But then they have mostly students who've been on these projects. They've written a little pamphlet about their project. They meet together in breakout groups. They present their project, but they listen to other people. That's really important to develop this whole history and to relate it to the history of each village, to the relate it to the history of each UN institution, to relate it to Islam, to relate it to Panchasila, and create or sustain Indonesian culture. Um, his, his number one step is you start with the villagers. Nothing is top down. You ask them, well, what assets do you have? Which of those assets do you want to develop? Um, do they have the human and material assets to set the project up, to finish it, and to keep it going into the future? This is more like Socrates. Socrates was not top down. He didn't tell people anything. He asked them, well, what do you think? What do you think justice is? What do you think education is? All right, so step one is the volunteers get a tour of the village. They should ask questions and listen and write down the answers. And then if a meeting, you know, when they converge, the, the community engagement project members start with what the villagers said, what they're saying now. They shouldn't come with preconceptions um, or the idea that they would know better than the villagers because if the villagers don't buy into it, it's not going to work. In a vacuum, something might be better than what they choose, but the very fact they chose it they're going to be invested in it, is what will make it work. Okay, then you have brainstorming. The villagers present many possibilities, and then gradually they decide which one they prefer. This is Aristotle's notion of deliberation, if you remember. The goal is always maximizing human flourishing. You have to make a decision. You, you have... We have to make a choice. What are the options? Are there some ideas you would like, but they're not possible? Are there some possibilities you haven't considered? So you get all the real options there. Which ones would the villagers buy into? Which ones do they have the assets to do? And then they come to a conclusion. They need to all come to a consens con consensus and agree on it so they can actually have the motivation to do it. Um, then the village leaders communicate the plan to the public, making sure that the public, the villagers know that the leaders have bought into this. It's not what the professors came and told them. And then the community would commit. Gotong Royong, they should work together in interfaith groups based on humanitarian goals and cooperation 
and they would create unity and diversity. They would engage in dialogue, come up with insights, and it's part of the social contract. The government insisted that professors do that because it's part of what the government owes the people for helping them develop, and then the people owe other citizens to help them flourish. So you can make clear to the villagers that the whole process reinforces Panchasila. All right, step five is to distribute the tasks based on each person's capacities and interests. And again, it should be the villagers as much as possible who either volunteer for certain things or the village leaders ask, request, as little, you can't use force. It has to be completely dialectical and also motivated by the villagers. So the village leaders facilitate the construction of necessary infrastructure using local resources, the expertise of villagers. They assign tasks related to the long-term operations. So it's not just short-term, it's um, a, a, a long-term commitment to this. Again, it should be the village leaders then there should be outside evaluators who are experts in whatever it is they're doing to assess each program, whether it's feasible and its impact, and then make adjustments. So the villagers and the village leaders ought to acknowledge that they need experts to make sure they know what they're doing or that what they're doing is, is going to work. And then there has to be, you could also have collaboration between villages. They can share their assets. They can exchange assets. They can create a barter system. So maybe there's, uh, if there isn't a community engagement project in nearby villages, maybe those villages could request one from the closest school. Uh, you know, they could become much more aware of that they have some uh, agency. They can ask because the professors need to do this. They can also um, maybe set up their own um, engagement projects with the resources that they have. That if the major UCE project is, for example, creating a bottled water factory. That was one of the things Jaruts did. Um, maybe another village has decided that they have arable land that they haven't been farming and they agree on uh, a certain crop that they want to grow in that area. I would assume it's one that hasn't yet been exploited by international companies. Uh, corporations, uh, fast food companies or whatever. And um, they could sell, right? Or barter water for crops. Um, one village might want to start uh, a better school, a higher quality school. And the other villagers would send their kids there in exchange for the assets that the other villages have. They could arrange to hire some teachers who are more highly educated. Anyway, there's all these ways that villages could collaborate and lift up that region of Indonesia. Um, step 10 is villagers can teach each other, teach members of nearby villages and the long-term impacts. Um, you wanna structure it so there are long-term social networks Maybe people from these villages get together periodically for some sort of celebration and they set up certain times in the year, maybe three times in the year or something that gets institutionalized so that it, it maintains itself over time. It's an established social network. Um, democracies depend on the people taking care of themselves and working together developing trust and goodwill for each other. That's what Aristotle said. Not just democracies, any kind of stable society, people need to be generous, 
because that promotes trust and goodwill, but especially democracies. These projects can promote a high quality of community life, what Aristotle called a polis or a political community where people are bound together by a common set of laws rather than family or friends or commercial interests. So these bonds can go way beyond just economic interests, um, but they also are under the umbrella of political leaders who set up this level of interaction because that's the way to have a flourishing human society. It's more than just money. Um, so in the trading water for food, it could be more of a barter system rather than just a commercial enterprise. Because in many, many places, it's international corporations that come in and the relationship is not community oriented. It's profit oriented. It's ex exploitative exploitative. It's the villagers are forced to plant certain crops in certain land. They're cash crops for rich people in rich uh, first world nations to consume or to uh, use to make other consumer products. And so there could be a clear difference between the kind of bartering and interaction of assets in the community-based uh, engagement, university engagement projects than there is in the corporate um, exploitation of people. The unique contributions of faculty members. So in addition to all of this, the faculty members should be down there and doing physical work with people, but they can also build a knowledge base Okay, they can make videos, they can record minutes of meetings, they can write pamphlets about a project. They can we, uh, have the pamphlets published and put into a village library or a village archive, village museum, whatever, and then also put into the universities, the UN universities all around the country so that there's this meeting of the minds, right? Koinonia. So there's this broader and broader, uh, more intricate history that's being created and sustained. Uh, faculty members can teach the story of a UCE project and of the entire institution of UCE. So they can um, go and teach. Once they've written the pamphlet, they can go and lecture elsewhere they can show the broader public that they care, they're connected, they care about Indonesians, they care about the poor in the villages, there are people living in remote places, and they could talk about the entire institution of UCE so that, you know, people, so they aren't elite. They aren't elitist. They don't separate themselves. They don't use their education to separate themselves and to consider themselves superior to the villagers. Um, okay, so on the one hand, they can do physical work, but they can also make these extra contributions. Um, there could be a celebration. You bring the publication into the village. You have a party, and life goes on. So... Indonesian scholars have a great deal to contribute to the cultivation of democracy and the prevention of polarization and authoritarianism. And this is worldwide, you know, they can, what they do can be a model that other countries could imitate. Um, Malaysia or some nearby countries might be more, you know, aware of what Indonesia is doing. Uh, seems to me, as an American, we can learn a lot from them. But it's also true, and I think I wrote this in um, 2023. I was there in 2022, I think at the end of 2022, and Jokowi was about to step up as the president of ASEAN for 2023. Um, 
He's already called for peace between the U.S. and China, and he also demands that the ASEAN nations be able to determine who their trading party parties are and not to be used as proxies in the relationship between the two big powers. They shouldn't have economic sanctions put on them if they trade with one or the other. Um, this, uh, this is particularly important that the global, the world know that when the president of ASEAN says stuff like that, we wanna be left alone, the US and China can have their little bipolar problems, but we want to trade with each other. We want to trade with who we want. Well, that brings up the ghost of the spirit of Bandung when Sukarno uh, organized the Third World Conference where countries in Southeast Asia and Africa and the developing world got together and told Russia and the U.S. Uh, the U.S. SR and America that they want to form their own bloc. They don't want to become part of this polarization. Um, interestingly enough, the same thing happened in Greece uh, when Athens and Sparta were going against each other. Uh, Melos, there were city states that just wanted to be left alone and uh, Athens didn't leave them alone. Um, and Sparta, they created these power blocks and it was, it did not go well. But anyway, um, Indonesia can stand, stand up and people in the rest of the world can find out about this, that this is an old tradition in Indonesia ever since it got its independence. So um, Indonesia's interests are consistent with the promotion of a world where each society is treated equally in relation to other nations and internally leaders treat their own citizens as equals before the law. So this explains why Indonesia is a, a very prominent supporter of the United Nations, why they are supporters of sustainability. Um, it just puts it all together, Panchasila and all and does so in a more public way so that the intellectuals, cultural leaders in the rest of the world sort of understand where Indonesia stands. Um, Indonesia shouldn't be perceived as just another place where business people come and, and do business, right? It has its own culture. It shouldn't just be exploited. And that was my last lecture about the way the World Bank and the IMF treat these countries. They're oblivious to their cultures. It's really offensive. It's very barbaric and it's not going to work. It's simply not going to lead us to an international sustainable civilization. Even if Bill Gates and the engineers and all these people can engineer um, whatever they need to engineer so we could have a zero carbon or even a negative carbon. We need culture also. Human beings are not machines and they are extensions of, of a computer. So Indonesia can bring in the cultural side of it and they can link that to humanistic Islam and then other countries can also contribute what they have to contribute. So. Um, I do think, you know, all these things are very positive aspects of Indonesian culture.